Welcome to today's video on global atmospheric changes. I'm Aida Awad from Broward College. The learning targets for this video will be to differentiate between weather and climate, to inventory Earth's energy budget, to analyze differences in solar radiation at different latitudes and to predict seasonality, identify the sources of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, describe how the greenhouse effect works, and to explain the concept of radiative forcing. Now, throughout this video, we're going to be talking about some fairly controversial issues. And so I'm going to stick to using data and imagery that comes from some sources such as NOAA, the NSIDC, the U.S. Department of Energy. Starting off with talking about weather versus climate. Weather is the conditions in the atmosphere at a given place and time. So what's it like outside your window right now? Climate are weather patterns that occur in a place over a period of years. And the two key variables here are temperature and precipitation. With climate, the changes happen slowly over a period of hundreds or thousands of years normally. And organisms that live in a particular area have adapted to those climate conditions. Let's turn now to looking at solar radiation and climate. Let's take a look through the diagram first of all. So of the solar radiation that enters Earth's atmosphere, about 31% of it is reflected back out into space. That's reflection by particles in the atmosphere, about 3%, reflection by clouds in the atmosphere, about 19%, and reflection off of ice, snow, and other light-colored land surfaces, about 9%. The absorption by land and ocean that heats up the Earth is about 49%. So in total, we have absorption of about 69%, absorption by gases and particles that are already in the atmosphere of about 17%, and absorption by the clouds of about 3%. So when we talk about totals here, we're talking about 69% of the solar radiation reaching Earth being absorbed, and that powers the hydrologic cycle, the carbon cycle, and the other biogeochemical cycles. Solar radiation is converted to infrared radiation as it returns back out to space. And the total, about 1,366 watts per square meter of solar radiation, that enters Earth's atmosphere results in about 1,000 watts per square meter at Earth's surface. So let's take a look at what happens with that solar radiation now in terms of changes in temperature with latitude and seasons. In the top diagram, we can see the red lines indicating solar radiation hitting the Earth's surface. Here, when that solar radiation hits the Earth's surface at the equator, we notice that it makes a focused, concentrated, circular spot. However, solar radiation that's incident upon high latitudes, because of the angle, spreads out over a larger area. So it's not focused and it's not concentrated. Well, what does that result in? That gives us seasons, along with the fact that the Earth is tilted about 23 and a half degrees on its axis. So in this diagram, we can see the Earth as it's orbiting around the sun and as it's tilted on its axis. Let's start over here on the right side. So on the right side, we're seeing the example of summer in the northern hemisphere. So you can see that North America, in this case, is bathed in sunlight, uh, where the sun would be nearly overhead around the summer solstice in June. And on the opposite side, we see that the northern hemisphere is away from, and tilted away from the sun, and the southern hemisphere is now tilted so that solar radiation is incident right above your head our attention now to looking at some of the evidence for global climate change. This top diagram, the data comes from NOAA here, and this diagram shows from the year 1880 through to 2015 the anomaly relative to 20th century temperature averages. So being careful to read this graph correctly, zero anomaly means that the temperature average would be the same as it was for the entire 20th century. Anything above this zero line would indicate that it's warmer than the 20th century temperature average. Anything below that zero line would indicate that it's cooler than the 20th century average. And in this diagram, we can see that up until about the year 1940, temperatures in general were in fact cooler than the 20th century temperature averages. But since the year 1940, if we look just at the blue trend line, temperatures have been steadily increasing above the 20th century anomaly. Now, those increases have also increased heat waves and heat-related illness and deaths. 
we've seen sea level rise, glacier retreating, more severe storms, droughts, and floods. And we'll look at some of those things in a few minutes. Not only are the average global temperatures increasing, but those temperatures vary by regions, where the polar regions aren't warming at the same rate as the equatorial regions. And we can see that in NOAA's data here in the bottom right-hand corner. So this is land and ocean temperature data from 2016. And just quickly noticing that anything that's colored in a blue color is cooler than average. Anything that's colored in a red color is warmer than average, with the darkest red being the highest warming and the darkest blue being the strongest cooling. So we can see the pattern here shows us that temperatures are not changing uniformly across the globe. Some additional data related to climate change come from carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases trap infrared radiation in Earth's atmosphere. And the more CO2, the more heat is trapped. Data from the IPCC tell us that there is a prediction for a temperature increase of 2 to 5.5 degrees C by the year 2100. And they're predicting greater temperature variations, changes in precipitation patterns, including floods and droughts. Let's look at the data. So the red up and down squiggly line is the actual concentration data. So you're seeing the seasonal variation there. And the black line is the seasonally corrected data from 1960 through to uh, 2016 for concentration of CO2. And you can see that it has go gone from under 320 parts per million to over 400 parts per million. Well, how does that stack up historically? In the bottom diagram, we can see historical data in thousands of years before present. So the present day is on the far right here, moving back in time to as far back as 400,000 years before today. And on the y-axis, we see carbon dioxide. And if you look at the pattern from most recent to back about 400,000 years ago, we've seen several cycles where CO2 has varied between about 180 parts per million and 300 parts per million. But it has not, in this time period, been anywhere near as high as the over 400 parts per million that it is currently today. Some of the things responsible for that are the greenhouse gases. And in this diagram, we can see greenhouse gas emissions by sector. So taking a look at the far left colorful pie chart here, we notice that 21% of greenhouse gas, gas emissions come from power stations, that 16.8% come from industrial processes, and 14% come from transportation fuels, and you can look at the lesser percentages. To the right, we have three diagrams, one specifically for carbon dioxide that indicates that 295 of the carbon dioxide emissions come from power stations, and 20.6% come from industrial processes. For methane, 40% comes from agricultural byproducts and 29.6% comes from fossil fuel retrieval, processing, and distribution. For nitrous oxide, primarily here 62% of it is coming from agricultural byproducts with about 26% coming from uh, land use and biomass burning. So That's good data on greenhouse gases and where they are coming from. But what exactly is the greenhouse effect? We have a cartoon here that gives us the basics of the greenhouse effect, starting here with solar radiation that powers our climate system. And that solar radiation is incident on the Earth. Some of it, of course, is absorbed by the Earth, warms it, and drives our cycles. Some of that solar radiation is reflected back out into the atmosphere and out into space. The greenhouse comes into play when some of that infrared radiation passes through the atmosphere but most of it is absorbed and re-emitted in all directions by greenhouse gas molecules and clouds. And the effect of this is to warm the Earth's surface and to warm the Earth's lower atmosphere. And lastly, thinking about radiative forcings and climate change. So we're thinking here about the measure of the amount of Earth's energy budget that is out of balance. And that would be out of balance from both natural and anthropogenic causes. So things like deforestation, greenhouse gas emissions, volcanic eruptions. And radiative forcing is measured in watts per square meter. And included in this diagram, we'll see some information about aerosols that actually act to cool the atmosphere. So let's take a look at the diagram. Anything that's in red 
up here on the top right side you see is actively warming the atmosphere. Anything that's in blue or in the negative is acting to cool the Earth's atmosphere. And the net effect is a warming of Earth's atmosphere. In fact, the total radiative forcing of about 1.6 watts per square meter equates to a global value of about 800 terawatts. And just for context, that's many times more than the world's average rate of energy consumption. So I think we're ready to check back on our learning targets. They were to differentiate between weather and climate, inventory Earth's energy budget, analyze differences in solar radiation at different latitudes and predict seasonality, identify sources of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, describe the greenhouse effect, and talk about radiative forcing. Go ahead and take your master check quiz, and I'll see you in class.